Good morning. I'm Pastor Dave. I'm happy to share with you one of the most famous parables of all, the Good Samaritan. I'm asking that God would just bless you as you hear this and bring to your remembrance what he wants you to remember. Let's pray. Father, what can we say? You have the words of eternal life. You bring unto us the very richest blessing. Speak to us as we read your word. Fortify our experience of what it means to really love the way you want us to love. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're looking today, before we look at the Good Samaritan, we're going to be looking at Matthew 13, 10 to 13. The disciples came to him and asked, Why do you speak in parables? He replied, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. This is why I speak to them in parables. Through seeing, they do not see. Through hearing, they do not understand. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet in Psalm 78, 2, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. Now, what I like to do first is take a look at the scene of the story. The road from Jerusalem to Jericho was a notorious, dangerous road. Jerusalem is 2,300 feet above sea level. The Dead Sea, near which Jericho stood, is 1,300 feet below sea level. So that in a little more than 20 miles, this road dropped 3,600 feet. It was a rocky, narrow passage and a sudden turning which made it sort of a happy hunting ground for bandits. In the 5th century, it was called the Bloody Way. In the 19th century, you still had to pay people to be able to have a safe journey. When Jesus was telling this story, he was telling about the kind of thing that was constantly happening on this Jerusalem-Jericho road in his day. Now, we're going to look at some of the characters. You know, the traveler, he was obviously sort of reckless, foolhardy character. Peter, Peter Paul would seldom, why would you go on this road alone? Particularly if you're carrying anything of value. They would go in groups for protection. This man had no one but himself to blame for the plight that he found himself in. There was the priest who hastened past this man. The law stated that if he touched a dead man, he would be unclean for seven days and lose his turn of duty at the temple. Ceremonial laws were more important than charity. There was the Levite. He seemed to go nearer, but he may have been afraid that the man may have been a decoy with another man or two hiding nearby. His model, safety first. There was the Samaritan. We know two things about him. His credit was good, and the innkeeper was prepared to trust him. He may, secondly, he may have been theologically unsound, but he was alone prepared to help. 
we call this story today the parable of the Good Samaritan. And many of you, I'm sure, know this by heart. Three things I want to point out. First, Jesus did not give a definition of the word neighbor, but gave an illustration of neighborliness. Second, this is not really a parable. It's not an allegory where each figure represents a spiritual uh, analog. That's not in this case. Third, why was there hate between the Jew and the Samaritan? Now, when King Solomon died, his son Rehoboam became king. Rehoboam acted foolishly, and ten of the tribes separated from Judah and Benjamin, and they became a separate kingdom. It was called Israel, with Judah in the south, under Rehoboam. This was the ninth century, and King Omri of the northern kingdom made his capital on the hill of Samaria. But there were constantly battles between the two of them. In 1722 BC, Israel fell to the Assyrians. Many of the inhabitants of the city and the surrounding area of Samaria were led into captivity. Some farmers and others were left behind. But they intermarried with the new settlers from Mesopotamia and Syria. The Samaritans were condemned condemned for intermarrying with Gentiles. Second Kings accounts this story of how the worship of Yahweh was mixed with the worship of strange gods. When Cyrus permitted the Jews to return from the Babylonian exile, the Samaritans were all ready to welcome them back. The exiles, though, despised the Samaritans as renegades. The Samaritans wanted to join in rebuilding the temple. Their assistant was rejected. With the rejection came political hostility and opposition. The Samaritans tried to undermine the Jews and their Persian rulers, and they tried to stop the rebuilding of the temple. For defiling the priesthood by marrying a non-Jewish woman, Nehemiah drove out Eli Ashib from Jerusalem. And according to Joseph, Josephus, they went and then set up a break between them, the Jews and the Samaritans, and they built their own temple on Mount Gerizim. Samaritans later allied themselves with the Seleucians in the Maccabean Wars, and in 108 BC, the Jews destroyed the Samaritan temple and ravaged the territory. Now, to get back at them, around the time of Jesus' birth, a band of Samaritans profaned a temple in Jerusalem by taking and scattering bones of dead people. Wow. In our area, we've witnessed vandalism of synagogues, the burning of black churches. So we should understand the anger that was and hatred that would arise because of something like this. The fact that there was such dislike and hostility between the Jews and Samaritans is what gives the use of the Samaritan in the parable of the Good Samaritan such force. The Samaritan in today's story is one who's able to rise above bigotry and the prejudice of the centuries and to show mercy and compassion for the injured Jew after the Jews' own countrymen passed them by. It is with those centuries of opposition and incidents behind the people that we can understand the surprise of the Samaritan woman in John 4, 9, when Jesus rises above the social and religious restrictions, not just of a man, but actually talking to a woman but also talking to a Samaritan. Now let's read the story from Luke 10. Now a lawyer stood up and tested Jesus, saying, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? 
How do you read it there? He answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength, and with all of your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, Who is my neighbor? And Jesus answered, A man went from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounding him, and departed, leaving him half dead. By chance, a certain priest came down that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he came to that place, looked at him and passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went and, ba and bound him up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. Then he set him on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, that's worth two days' labor in today's uh, money market, and gave to them to the innkeeper. And he said, take care of him. I will repay when I return. Jesus then said, Now which of these three do you think was a neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? He said, The one who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. Let's analyze the story that Jesus told Go and do likewise. Now, the Samaritan showed kindness out of his heart. The main difference between him and the priest and the Levite were that they measured kindness out of the letter of the law. What does the law require of me? Now, if the law said to help someone in need on the road, then I'm sure that both the priest and the Levite would have stopped and helped the wounded man according to what the law said. But the law said to love your neighbor as it yourself. The law doesn't say who the neighbor is, therefore. They imagine that they're under no legal obligation to do anything on behalf of this man. In the mind of the Samaritan, however, Love meant doing everything possible within his power for all the required, all that required for his help. Therefore, without asking any questions or making any excuses, he gave the poor man all the assistance that he could. Where the law is so broad as to be applicable to certain circumstances, there's always the danger that some will feel no obligation at all in any circumstance. If we do only that which is formally prescribed, and if the law leaves a, a blank to be filled up by circumstances, we tend to act as if there's no law at all. As a Christian who was learning to walk with Je Jesus, we soon realize that the Bible is not a list of do's and don'ts but it is a book of living principles of universal application. When we ask, who is my neighbor? The Holy Spirit teaches us that any sufferer whom we can assist is our neighbor. Jesus also warns us in Matthew 25 about the sheep and the goats. Here's what he said. For I was hungry, and ye gave me food. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. 
I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked and clothed, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to, to me. Then the righteous will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you like that? As surely say I to you, inasmuch as you've done it to one of the least of my brethren, you did it to me. In the second place, this man was not hindered by prejudice of race, of nationality, or religion. The injured traveler was a complete stranger to him. He did not say into, by, to himself, oh, this man's a Jew. He has no claim on me because Jews won't even talk to me. Or he didn't say, well, he's not of my religion, so I'm under no obligation. He did not say, well, what nationality is him? Is he? Nationality is swallowed up by humanity. Prejudice disappears in love. This is what he saw. This man is in great need, and I need to help him or he might die. Now, in our modern world, they have a caste system in India and in Hindu cultures, and they sign groups of people by birth to follow certain regulations. They divide people to hierarchies where certain people are more privileged than others. It's commonly supposed that this is just a heathen thing, that it has no existence in the modern world. Nonsense. The word caste may be foreign to our words here in America, but unfortunately, there are those who still believe that those who live in poorer houses have a darker skin than themselves, exist for their benefit. As a consequence, they look down on them and believe that they're better than they are or of higher place in life. Like the priest, like the Levite, they would just say, well, I can pass by on the other side, avoid getting my hands dirty. But true love knows nothing of such distinctions. Rich or poor, black or white, Caucasian or Mongolian, all are alike in the Savior's love. We know by heart, John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he died so that all who believe in him may have eternal life. And while we were still in our sin, the Lord called us willingly, inviting us to become his sons and his daughters. But this we discover that oftentimes, the lower we stoop, the higher we soar. Think of that. When I was a young pastor, Roman Catholics and Protestants looked down, well, I should say before I was a minister, I was brought up in a church that was all converted Catholics. And we kind of looked down at the Catholics. It affected me to a certain extent. The year I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, I was at a conference on the Holy Spirit with my wife, Marion. <clears throat> we met another couple, and we began to pray. All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit fell on us. It was so beautiful. The power, the love of God just bound the two of us together in, in the strength of this Holy Spirit. Such a wonderful thing. <laughs> then I discovered the other couple were Roman Catholic. And I said, all right, Lord, <laughs> I got the message. They're my brothers and sisters. Thank you for removing prejudice from me. You see, priest and Levite were also seeking to make themselves purer than the average person. So if they would come in contact with somebody impure, it would contaminate them. And by reaching out to those lower than themselves, wow, 
Where would we have been if God ever acted on that principle towards us? But love overcomes all obstacles. And a person who receives God's love in their heart discovers that prejudice begin to dis disappear. And when the ugly weed does show up, we need to be quick to pull out by its roots. In the third place, it's obvious that this man's benevolence was not hindered by consideration any considerations of personal convenience. Now, this Samaritan could have thought, I must be, on I must be the Jericho. I I've got urgent business. Or he could have said, I found this man, but I might get in trouble if someone sees me by him. They might think that I robbed him. Or, hey, the cruel robbers, they could be hiding, waiting to get me. Or he could say, hey, I can't afford to do all that's necessary. It's costing me too much if I do that. He could not do anything, though, but help this poor man. Sure, it's going to cost him something. But if that poor man was me, oh, I'd be thanking God that somebody was willing to stop to help me. He rushed into action. He forgot about himself. This man needs help right away. Let me take care of his wounds. Give him something to drink. Let him know that he's safe now. He doesn't have to worry. You know, I got to get him off the road. Put him on my donkey. Get him near to some inn where he can get healed. Now, there are many ways that some people could respond. Well, I'm going to give in such a way so people will know it, then I'll be honored. Oh, we don't say that, but that's what we're really thinking. Or, I'm going to give because it may secure a more coveted position for me. Or, I'll give money so I don't have to get involved. No personal involvement. Or, others might say, we'll give personally, just so I don't have to be involved. How did this Samaritan give? Genuine neighborliness love is ready to sacrifice up to the extent of the necessity which is needed, whatever is needed. Bless God that there are many who love in that way. I have seen wealthy Christians give and use their money to help those in need. I have seen poor Christians giving out of their compassion. I have seen where ones that you wouldn't expect, those who weren't in the upper realms of society, giving to, uh, to down and outers just like them. The Samaritan's benevolence took from the nature of the misery. As I mentioned, he bound up the wounds with oil and wine. He used his donkey, brought him to the lodging and paid for it, and agreed to pay more if necessary. Whatever was necessary, this man was willing to do. Many people sometimes try to help without knowing how to be helpful. Through the act might be meant to be helpful, sometimes it could be a failure. Don't tell a mother at a funeral of their child that her child must have been special so God took him. Any illness or accident is not God's will. The death of George Floyd was not God's will, nor murdering anyone is God's will. We have an enemy who comes to Lie, destroy, and kill. It's the devil, not God. Common sense tells us, teaches us, to be aware of the need and then see what is best way to help. Years ago, I was a pastor of a large uh, church right in, the right in the center of town. 
And I always had people stopping, asking for a handout, usually to buy beer or something else they didn't need. Yet how do I know if their need was real? They had stories that were unbelievably trying to convince you. So I came up with a solution. I always offered them a job right on the spot with a nice way to pay. I also set up conditions at a local diner just a block away that they would feed them whatever they needed. But my policy was never to give out money because I didn't know what they're going to do with it. Word got around <laughs> and many stopped coming. Suffering must de be determined in the form in which it's best met for that benevolence. Jesus said, go and do likewise. And what does that mean for here and now? And how do you know if that person was Jesus or an angel testing you to see if you really loved them? Remember the scripture? And then, what does this say to us about prejudice and race relationships? Christians must be the leading ones in breaking down prejudice and hostilities. We must be the ones who, who are the, on the forefront of showing love, forgiveness, and showing brotherhood. The bottom line is simply this. Jesus is saying this to us. If our benevolence would be of the highest order, it must be done for him, showing his love, his mercy to whoever needs it. Matthew 25, 41 to 46 says this. Then he will say to those on his, his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed in the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't invite me in. I needed clothes, you did not clothe me. I was sick, I was in prison, you did not look after me. They will say, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger of needing clothes or sick or in prison? It did not help you. He replied, I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Was it not Jesus himself, in a very exalted sense, the Good Samaritan to the human race. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. He laid down his life that we might be delivered. So let us make a cheerful sacrifice of everything, money, time, or even if need be, our life itself. Was it not Jesus himself, in a very exalted sense, the good Samaritan to the human race? For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, he became poor. Wow. What shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? Be that good Samaritan, ever ready to reach out, to lift someone up, and to show them the love of Jesus. May you all be blessed. Amen.